very straightforward. You can go for Okay, uh, hello everyone, welcome to this session. I'm Stuart, your session host, and um, we have three talks today. So Benjamin Mako Hill, Tilman Byer, and Aaron Shaw be talking about the state of Wikimedia scholarship 2013 to 14. Then Jesse Wild Sneller, Jonathan Morgan, and Yana Wellender talking about human centered design for free knowledge. And then a panel talking about the reform of citation structure for all Wikimedia projects. Uh, we want to encourage free flow during the session, so feel free to leave the room at any point. And in the spirit of sharing knowledge and encouraging dialogue with people at Wikimania and beyond, please tweet using the hashtag Wikimania2014. Uh, so now let's welcome Benjamin Mako Hill, a member of the Wikimedia Foundation Advisory Board, with Tilma Bayer, who works in the Wikimedia Foundation's communications team, and Aaron Shaw, an assistant professor at Northwestern. They're here to talk about the state of Wikimedia scholarship. All right, well, uh, so I definitely see some people in the audience who I've seen before at previous versions of this talk. I've been doing some version of this with a group of collaborators, includes these people and other people not here since 2008. This began as an excuse for me to stay up to date on Wikipedia, Wikimedia research in my uh, day job. I am uh, an academic and I study Wikipedia among other projects. I proposed a talk in 2008 to try to run a quick tour, a literature review of the last year's academic landscape around Wikimedia and its projects geared towards non-academic editors and readers. I said that I would try to categorize, distill, describe the academic landscape as it's shaping up around the project. Um, the idea was is that uh, you know I, I could use this as an excuse to sort of go back and look at all the stuff that I probably should have been reading in the last year anyway by all my colleagues who were also studying Wikipedia and sort of summarize it. So about two weeks before my talk, um, you should be very proud of me, it was the whole two weeks before, I tried to do the uh, Google Scholar search just to try to sort of build the literature review of the things that I wanted to see. I saw a, res a result like this which said something like, 800 results um, of things published in the last year. I was like, oh no. Um, uh, I, that's, um, I, both because I was going to try to actually talk about everything, which would, uh, over a 45 minute talk, which was longer than this year, it ended up being like, you know, I'd have four seconds per paper to talk about. I actually tried to import the whole list into Zotero, my citation management software, and um, I got banned from Google Scholar for like, abusing the system. Um, uh, uh, because like no human could realistically consume the amount of uh, material published on Wikimedia projects in the last year alone, right? Um, this year this talk is even shorter. Uh, so you get an idea of what we're up against. Um, 
in uh, there's an enormous amount of research about about Wikipedia and about Wikimedia. Um, there are, uh, uh, according to Google Scholar, there are more than 500 papers published about Wikipedia each year. Um, it seems that we've reached some sort of peak, but we not exactly falling through the floor. There are still uh, there are still uh, over 500 papers published according to Google Scholar results on uh, with Wikipedia in the title each year. Uh, um, as another couple data points, um, uh, Google Scholar can double count things and include things that aren't really academic articles in many cases. Um, according to another metric, there are only 3,000 uh, Wikipedia-related publications in, in Scopus. Um, uh, there is an effort which I'm going to point everyone to at the end and provide a link to. These slides are also uh, linked from the uh, talk page about this talk in the Wikimania Wiki, and you can uh, you can go there and follow through on all the links. The, um, but there's a research newsletter where now every single month people are basically doing an online version of this talk summarizing recent things published on Wikimania. They reviewed more than 160, I say we, I think I reviewed like two. Um, uh, um, uh, we, Tillman <laughs> did a, a larger portion, so I'll take credit for it all though, right? Um, uh, reviewed an enormous amount of uh, things over the last month. So uh, the goals here. Uh, this is the sort of disclaimer uh, slide, uh, 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 sort of explaining what it is that we're trying to do. Um, in selecting, uh, what we're going to end up doing is showing you a set of postcards. We've gone through the list of things which are written up in the newsletter, which are gone through a list of Google, essentially like Google Scholar alerts of, about research published in the last year. We tried to put it into themes and then uh, group, it, group things into themes and then select what we think are important themes that have uh, that are sort of either new or really uh, dominant in terms of characterizing the state of Wikimedia scholarship. And then we tried to select one paper um, from each one, which we think is, if not representative, then at least sort of uh, a good example of the kind of work being done in that space. Uh, while we're trying to do that, we've uh, tried to focus on things which we think are going to be of some interest to you, uh, you can tell us afterwards if you think we've succeeded. And we're going to try to focus on research which is done by people who are not in Wikimania. So if we talk about your research, then we screwed up. Um, uh, so uh, with that aside, I want to get into uh, a set of these postcards. We're going to try to spend uh, no more than three minutes on any one topic or theme. And we're going to be sort of, we've divided up the work of going through these themes and papers. So we'll sort of move through it uh, in that way. I'm going to try to take the first one, which is going to talk a little bit about a new body of research that we've really sort of, uh, not new in the sense that no one did it before, but something which has really blossomed this, blossomed this year, which is around event prediction. And it's around prediction of things in the world using viewership data from Wikipedia. So the Wikimedia Foundation has a lot of people who have been doing research on Wikimedia, but in Wikipedia, but almost all that work has looked at the content of the encyclopedia or, or the people who are uh, producing it. So think of edit histories, the kinds of things you see in view changes. Um, the Wikimedia Foundation has also, for the last several years, been publishing data on uh, sort of aggregate viewership across articles. And although the data has been available for a while, the last year a number of people really started using this data. And one of the things that a lot of people were using it for is trying to predict things in the world. So one cool example of this from the last year is around um, uh, essentially the influenza prediction. Now, um, uh, this is a paper published in uh, a journal called uh, PLOS Computational Biology, um, and it talks about uh, estimating uh, influenza-like illnesses in the United States in real time using uh, information on which pages are being viewed in Wikipedia um, or how often pages about influenza are being viewed in Wikipedia. Now, you may have heard of uh, a project called, uh, uh, run by Google called Google Flu Trends. Um, and Google Flu Trends is essentially, uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in predicting, uh, in knowing how many people are getting influenza. Um, so the, uh, because it's, it's very useful to understand um, if, if, if there's a, a, you know, an epidemic uh, which is sort of exploding, then the government wants to know that lots of people are getting influenza and they can help mobilize vaccination or um, respond to this um, accordingly. Now, the, uh, History, the, the problem is, is that the way in which they collect this data, the Center for Disease Controls in the US, and there's a similar organization in Europe, they collect it by looking at hospitals and see who's coming in. And the result is that data is usually between seven and 14 days late, in the sense that you only know what's going on two weeks later. Now, Google's decided, figured out that they could predict um, better uh, or very well um, uh, who, who were getting 
flu-like symptoms by looking for people searching for things like cough or flu-like symptoms or how do I fix the flu or something like this. Now, one problem with this is that it tends to be really biased by media coverage. So when the H1N1, the swine flu sort of uh, um, epidemic broke out, lots of people were searching for information about the flu, but not because they were sick. They were just like interested in know what was going on. So um, Wikipedia um, seems, uh, so the suggestion, suggestion for these researchers was that Wikipedia might be less biased in this result. Um, because uh, because it, it, people are not just interested for news, people who actually are looking for information on this, and it's also better because it, we understand what's going on, it's an open data source, unlike Google. Um, uh, they basically just measured traffic to flu-related articles on Wikipedia, and then they compared it to the gold for the last, um, uh, for the last seven years, and then compared it to the gold standard data from the Centers of Disease Control. What they found was that Wikipedia was really, really good at predicting. Um, this looks like it's one line, but it's actually two lines. The black line is the Center for Disease Control, and the red line is searches um, to Wikipedia articles. So it's like almost exactly the same. It turns out that this works much better than Google at producing uh, at predicting flu outbreaks. You can do it within. Um, you have the data within an hour or so of it coming out, so you have very close to real time data. Um, and it was uh, like 17% uh, better at predicting peak flu times than uh, than Google method. Um, people are predicting lots of other things as well, global disease, box office revenue, uh, kind of similar topic, election results in, uh, um, in Iran, Germany, and the UK, breaking news stories doesn't always work as well, um, but there's lots and lots of work in this space. All right, so with that, I want to pass this over to uh, Aaron, who's going to talk a little bit about another body of research. All right, hi, I'm Aaron Shaw. Um, so, uh, this area has been a gigantic area of research that uh, unless you're a linguist or a sort of usually a computational linguist, you probably don't spend a lot of time reading. Um, and so I'll apologize in advance because this is the one that the three of us as a group know the least about and are the least active in. Um, but it's really important because it turns out that about half of the research on Wikimedia projects and Wikipedia is actually sort of substantively focused on like what happens in the wikis or sort of how they're produced or things like that. And over 50, like 52% are using the data that Wikipedia that is created in the process of editing the wikis as a sort of corpus of text or natural language, right, that could be processed and through which insights can be generated. Um, so. Uh, we're going to talk about, let's see, this year we chose one of these, right? And, and, you know, keep in mind, right? So this is like a huge portion of that bar chart that Makeup showed you a few minutes ago. Um, but we're only talking about one. Uh, this is the paper we're talking about this year. Um, it's a, called Pivot-Based Multilingual Dictionary Building Using Wiktionary. Um, right? There's lots of terms in there that uh, I had to go look up to figure out what was going on. Um, but it turns, what's that? In Wiktionary. In Wiktionary, hopefully. Um, but it turns out that this is a really, really cool idea. Uh, I, I sort of got hooked on this paper, and maybe it's because I know very little about it, but um, I got really hooked on this paper when I read it, so I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, so the idea here is that uh, Wiktionary, because it has so many languages, has lots of what linguists call pivot words. Um, so the idea is that if you have, if you're looking to create a multilingual dictionary that links English and Hungarian, right? Um, it turns out that uh, if you can find other languages that have words, so let's say you've got a word in French that has a direct translation in Hungarian and a direct translation in English. Well, it turns out that that link between the three, right, that that's probably a good hint as to how you should trans, like the words that you should link in Hungarian and English, right? Does that make sense? So we're, we've got like sort of two sides of a triangle and we're looking to create the third side. So those are the pivots, right? And when you have, you know, they find that they're, they're, I think they use about 50 of the Wiktionary languages, so uh, those are the ones that are big enough to make it sort of worth their while. Um, and so they did this kind of triangulation, but they made it into more than triangles. They found that they could link lots of words this way with lots of pivots and basically get a better idea of how accurate that sort of translation would be. Um, so they did that, they manually evaluated it. Oh yeah, here, this is helpful, although it has a mistake. So this is sort of illustrating, um, say we had, we wanted to figure out whether uh, the words for you know dog in English and figure out what that is in German, right? So we, that's the pair that we don't know. Um, but we know all of these other linking words that connect those words in the two languages. Um, the mistake for those of you who aren't Portuguese or Spanish speakers is that that top one uh, is actually the Spanish word for dog, not the Portuguese word for dog. Um, I discovered that about two seconds before the talk. It's kind of fun. Um, yeah, it's cow or cachorro. Anyway, um, so they succeed in doing this. Um, they find that having these multiple connections actually produces about twice as precise a set of translations as just doing those triangles, 
right? So if you just use three languages, you do pretty well. You get about half of the words right. Um, these, these folks, this author, uh, she got it up to about 80 something percent accuracy, um, which she evaluated by sort of hand coding a small subset from all of the different languages that she did. Um, which if you think about it is sort of unbelievable, right? So uh, again, this is the kind of stuff that's possible when you sort of build on the unbelievable resources that are getting constructed by lots of people working independently. Um, so, oh, and one other thing that's kind of interesting is that the limitations of this stuff turns out to be the biggest limitation, turns out to be uh, polysync. So when words mean more than one thing. Um, that, it turns out, like this, doesn't really help you solve that problem. So uh, we'll leave it up to the linguists to figure out a smart solution to that for next year. And uh, next up is content quality, which Mako's going to talk about. All right, so th this is another one of these things that I seem to talk about almost every year, uh, um, in the sense that there's this little industry which hasn't really seemed to slow down about people who are really interested in understanding, like, is like 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 sort of this I don't know, disbelievable. Wikipedia can't be that high quality, or like uh, how high quality is it in particular area? So um, the vast majority of these th this work, I mean, almost every little subfield in the world has like run one of these studies. So this year there was a good one on hematology, where like what are the quality of hematology articles in Wikipedia compared to our own reference work, right? Um, and most of them involve some version of like comparing articles in two different places and discovering that in fact Wikipedia is just as good as the other version. So um, uh, there was one that I think is worth calling out is, and that is a, a thesis, uh, um, a, a thesis which was done by, uh, by Fernando Silverio Nifario Rodriguez. So in other words, stay and uh, also cool because it's a Portuguese language uh, Portuguese language piece of scholarship. Uh, we tend to be biased towards English language scholarship here, um, uh, but also was summarized in English in the URL down there, um, and which in many ways tries to build on the famous Britannica study from, gosh, when was it, 2007? Uh, yeah, yeah, but like, Jim Giles. Yeah, Jim Giles, so 2005, right. So uh, this was essentially trying to do this with a, with a random sample of articles, but a bigger sample. So the idea was to take uh, 200, 245 article pairs from both encyclopedias, have a bunch of experts grade them, so in this case not looking for errors, but sort of grading them along a five-point scale. Experts, experts were asked to concentrate only on the intrinsic aspects of the article's quality, accuracy, objectivity, discard the contextual, representational, and accessibility aspects. Um, and the experts were almost, were mostly university teachers, was what they, um, was what they found. The, the, um, but again, using the same sort of comparison between Britannica articles and, uh, and um, English Wikipedia articles. So uh, English Wikipedia articles, Portuguese, right out. Uh, uh, the results uh, were very much in line with what they found in the, very much what, what was found whoa, in, the, in the original Britannica article. They find that Wikipedia articles are systematically of, uh, rated by the group here of higher quality. So they, they rate them here as either far better, a lot better, much better, uh, better or equivalent. And as you can see, the large majority of articles that were uh, compared in those 245 groups uh, showed up, uh, Wikipedia ended up doing a little bit better. That uh, um, These were blind, they couldn't tell which one was which. Hmm? The professors who read these. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, that's what this says. Yes. Yeah. You only have a bunch of professors. Uh, uh, I don't know who the professors are, uh, uh, but you can read the, the, uh, the links are here, you can follow it. Like, what? Uh, uh, Right, um, uh, so the professors, whoever they are. Uh, professors are very, very, I, I, I trust professors. Uh, uh, I'm a professor. Uh, 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 I don't trust professors. Um, uh, 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 they also did a nice thing here of breaking it down. It's not just scientific articles, it's on a range of subjects. And um, you see, uh, you know, differences, uh, uh, you see that Wikipedia articles are systematically rated higher, but there are differences, uh, uh, slight differences across some of these different um, different topics, arts and entertainment, history, science, and travel and geography. All right, uh, all right. so uh, with that, I'm gonna pass over to our next category, which is uh, taken by Tillman. We fought a lot about this one, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, because of a conflict. I, I was the so which is actually, <laughs> this is a really uh, popular category. It has been last year, so there have been a lot of uh, papers about, for example, Compare which articles are, um, have most edited words in different languages, etc. We're going to present a paper by Kim Osman, who was a PhD student, I think, in Australia at last year's Wikisim, actually. It's called The Role of Content Determining Consensus and Quality in Wikipedia Articles. 
And what she did was, um, well, she did literally of uh, existing research on online communities. And then she went to uh, the talk page of one large article about the country was Australia and did a discourse analysis. So that means you go actually through the discussions and you code them um, in a ground theory approach. For those who haven't heard of ground theory, it's kind of a concept from uh, social science where you um, you start from the empirical data and then from your hypothesis. You, so you don't go in and have a, a hypothesis that you want to prove. But basically you, uh, you go in, you code these um, discussions and see what you find. And what she found uh, was um, uh, she actually that she got surprised because she expected to find a lot of uh, threats about collaboration. So people have to figure out um, how will you do this or I think this does. And then and she found a lot more conflict than she expected. That's kind of the bad news. Um, the good news that she found is um, it's a productive conflict. So uh, personal attacks were um, as opposed to disagreements about the, um, the content. And uh, so basically, uh, the others are playing the ball and not the men to talk football. And the, um, she also coded the uh, sources of conflict that people disagreed about. Oh, yeah, that's a slide. Um, <coughs> get it back here. Anyway, so um, it's about sourcing the wording of articles, the structure, right? Where do we put the section? and the accuracy of the content. And um, she mapped it out in sourcing the base, for example, the conflict has the um, effect that editors call each other out on the sources. I mean, Wikipedia and all know this, right? Yeah. You write something that, that someone or some other person does not agree with, they call you out for sources, you have to go and research and find good sources, and then you keep that in, and then it goes vice versa. And um, her conclusion is that uh, conflict is actually very productive, and she uses a term uh, called a concept called generative friction by a sociologist called um, what's his name is David Stark, I think, and uh, that basically says yeah, friction between people, but it's uh, generative, so it actually has a positive outcome as opposed to mere fighting. And another thing she did was to call the discussions by the policy references they, they make. So policies are quoted a lot, that was another of her findings. Um, and you can see the top 10 or so uh, that she found. So can do a test here with a real Wikipedia and recognizes all these uh, three or two letter codes. <laughs> Anybody who knows all of them? Yeah, so WQ is consensus. And you should also um, do the two informal and formal references. So like formal beef, if uh, somebody links to a reference like links to a policy, say, look up WPMPOV, and uh, informants like uh, somebody just talking about consens consensus, but kind of refers to the, the policy that's behind it. So, yes, so the topic is consensus, niche point of view, original research, no original research, discussion page, uh, um, primary sources, um, undue weight, reliable sources, and uh, a subsection of uh, no original research is synthesis. You don't synthesize um, uh, statements that are not in the origin sources. And six, it was 68, 86% of uh, that actually contained policy references. So her conclusion is that talk pages are really important or central tool for enforcing or actually implementing policies. Um, you know, people need to know about these policies, how do you learn about them? Not really through editing itself or through reading the talk pages, uh, through reading the policy pages themselves, but through these discussions with other editors on the talk page. Okay, so next, you know, I don't know, wiki products. I'm back. Um, all right. Uh, oh, and one other thing we should mention about the controversy stuff is that's another area that's like a huge kind of industry within Wikipedia and Wikimedia research. Um, there are lots and lots of papers about that. Um, so we're not necessarily communicating exactly what the relative importance of these different things are throughout our talk, but I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, Wiki projects are a sort of small but growing area of interest um, that sort of overlap more generally with an area that's particularly near and dear to my heart, which is thinking about um, how wikis and Wikimedia projects and other sorts of open peer production communities sort of work as organizations. Um, and so some of the most interesting work in this domain really tries to understand how those communities like compare across lots of them and start to understand what characteristics might lead them to grow or not 
might lead them to attract new contributors or not, and what might lead them to build successful, sort of thriving communities. Um, so the example that we picked in this area this year um, is a paper from uh, ICWSM is the name of this conference, the International Conference on Weblogs and Social Media. Um, I didn't make up the name, so apologies, it's kind of a mouthful. Um, and it's about uh, this area of theory that comes out of sociology about um, critical mass and how critical mass is of, of people and people involved is a, is a key part of building any sort of collective action. So if you think about social movements, volunteer movements, religious movements, any of these sorts of things where lots of people are getting together to try to do something, turns out that critical mass, having a lot of people show up sort of early on, seems to be a really important thing for predicting the long-term growth and sustainability of those kinds of movements. So what these folks did is they gathered data from uh, a little over a thousand wiki projects on English Wikipedia. Um, and what they do is they fit some statistical models to try to describe the sort of growth in terms of members and contributions to these projects. Um, right, and keep in mind, it's, a, it's, it's cumulative, so it never really declines over time. Um, but what you can talk about is whether the growth is, how the growth is changing over time, right? And so what they're interested in is whether you see sort of, uh, what, they're interested in comparing whether adding editors or adding contributions at an early stage in the project is more important in terms of the project's long-term growth, right? So hopefully you're with me on that, because it's an interesting question, right? If you're trying to start a new project, you're trying to build a new community, do you want to find like those two or three people who are really going to work really hard with you and just build out a lot of content? Or do you want to cast a wide net and recruit as many people as possible who maybe only make an editor two, right? So the stakes of this thing are actually really, really key. Um, oh, and here's just an example, you know, we need a picture for these. So this is sort of their, these are growth curves, right? So here's a, an accelerating curve in terms of the revisions, um, a, a linear curve that sort of goes flat over time, and a decelerating curve. So this gives you an idea of the kind of comparisons that they're making. Um, but they're not just looking at revisions, they're also looking at contributors, right, editors. Um, so unfortunately, there's no good graph illustrating their results. Well, what they find is that, um, Projects with more contributors early on are likely to experience more subsequent growth as opposed to projects with just more contributions from a smaller pool of contributors, right? Um, so they also find that contributions from a mix of sort of power users, right, people who contribute, individuals who contribute a ton, um, as well as individuals who contribute just a, just a few things is, good, is predictive of longer term project growth. So, I mean, the findings like this are really fascinating, and I think this is an area where we need to do a lot more work, um, and hopefully I'll get to do some of it, um, to try to figure out what sorts of strategies are most useful for projects at an early stage. So that's, uh, that's studies of wiki projects and organizations. And next up, we've got vandalism. Yeah, so this is about... Uh Vandalism. So this is a, a master thesis, which did a lot of um, use one of these large vandalism corpuses that are used to train vandalism detectors. And what she did is to um, classify the vandalism by various criteria. So, for example, the country that IP editors where you can actually determine the country based on the other IP, the time of day, which means that you try to guess where the editor's time zone is because it's an article that's specific to one time zone, like the UK, for example. Um, then the uh, content domain of the article, like the category, um, you can see some examples here. We can't show the examples, the results now for this, but she found some, for example, vandalism in the sports category, or in the one thing is um, anatomical parts category looks different than in some other categories. And the content of vandalism added, so the words that are being added or removed. And just very quickly, the, um, yeah, that's one of the results that um, I think uh, many people know this from the headmanship, right? And office hours also means school hours. So on the German Wikipedia, I know people have what I call the school shift They're on recent changes, like in the morning hours. So that kind of matches. And uh, in the evening, people are most productive. And another thing that's, um, so this chart shows um, edits from Indian vandals. 
So the, uh, she's an Indian herself, so I think she's a challenge. A lot of Indians, but anyway, so they vandalized Afghanistan a bit, Australia a bit, India a lot, and of course, most Pakistan. <laughs> and there's a lot of other examples like China, Taiwan, or Israel, and other countries. And here's the list of, or part of the list of the most common vandalism words, which is kind of puzzling, but it's what she found by analyzing. <laughs> so I leave the conclusions to you why um, bald, chicken, and rich women lead that. And what's nice about this paper is really that so there's a lot of things, papers who do a vandalism uh, detector training by machine learning, but don't really uh, explain the results and truly try to interpret that a bit. Okay, with that be next to the last one, which is edit the motivation. All right, so uh, quickly, this is, a, this is actually a, people may remember a study that I talked about in a previous version of this, which was an experiment where people went on Wikipedia and get, took the top 1% of most active editors in a given month and randomly gave 200 of them barn stars and then compared them to people that didn't get barn stars. And what they found was that when they randomly gave people barn stars, those people went on to edit much more and they actually went on to receive more barn stars. There was sort of a success breeds success metric. So this was a similar version of the study where they tried to follow up on this. But the difference was is that they gave barn stars not just to the top 1%, but also to people in the top, in the you know, 96th to 99th percentile and the 91st to 95th percentile. Um, and then they sort of compared the activity. Now, uh, this is a wall beyond the wiki, you can follow up later. Um, but what they found was that there was a benefit, the barn stars increased editing activity among the top 1%, but they found no effect um, among, the, among the lower, uh, the, the, the less active users. That they, that they worked as incentives, but only among the, the super most active um, editors, that for everyone else, they seemed to have no effect. Um, however, they did find something which is a little puzzling, and which I don't, they don't really understand, and which I don't completely understand either, which is that if they looked at retention over time, that they found they found that, that the, giving the barn stars had no effect in retention among the, the uh, most active editors and the ones in the 96th and 95th percentiles, but, but the, the barn star recipients actually stuck around less long among uh, 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 like uh, among the the, the, the earlier uh, the, the this 90th to 95th percentile so uh, uh, kind of a really interesting result I don't know what to think about it but uh, uh, yeah um, uh, in any case uh, that's what we've prepared here um, uh, there's lots more information uh, every month in the Wikimedia research newsletter um, that's the awesome logo for it um, uh, Wikisim is the oh, open sim I'm sorry uh, I actually have a paper there uh, this year so uh, Wikisim, what used to be Wikisim, is now OpenSim uh, because it's more open. Um, uh, there's a Wikipapers repository and there's lots more. These are all links you can follow up on there. Um, and then this year as well, there are actually a whole bunch of, uh, it's sort of a year of summing up in lots of ways. There have been a whole series of different literature reviews which have been out. There have been a series before as well. But this year in particular, there were a lot of people who tried to do really nice systematic reviews of hundreds of articles which have been written about Wikipedia and to think about some of the broader themes, um, some of which were mentioned here, a lot of ones um, uh, were not. So that's what we've prepared. Um, uh, uh, I guess there's uh, time to turn it over to the next, to the next uh, talk, but we'll be around and happy to follow up with everyone and the Wikimedia research uh, group is also a useful um, place to look. Cool. And then, because it's on the... Oh yeah, take it, I'll take it. Hmm? Oh yeah. Hi, so uh, thank you to Benjamin, Tillman, and Aaron. Now let's welcome Jesse Wilde-Sneller, Jonathan Morgan, and Diana Wallander, who all work at the Wikimedia Foundation, and they're here to talk about human-centered design for free knowledge. Just one moment, I made the fatal mistake of relying on the conference Wi-Fi for my presentation.
These are the notes. Great. Yeah. Good enough. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to talk to you about uh, a design method for creating things that work for people. It's called human-centered design. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Today with me are Jesse Wild Sneller and Yana Wellender. We work for the Wikimedia Foundation, and we've all used the human-centered design methods um, in our work for the foundation and also beyond. So in this talk, <laughs> uh, first I'm going to give a brief overview of what human-centered design is, uh, then Jesse is going to discuss why HCD fits into what we do at Wikimedia, and then uh, Yana is going to discuss a case study of HCD in the development of the Wikimedia Foundation's trademark policy. So what is human-centered design? First of all, uh, human-centered design, or HCD, is a design process. Uh, that is, it's a way of creating something, whether that's software or documents, or policies, or physical things, that serves the needs of a particular group of people. We call them users. For this reason, uh, human-centered design is also sometimes called user-centered design. There are three main components of an HCD process. Uh, the first is user research, figuring out what people do, what they want, and what they need. The second is an iterative, iterative design process, trying different design approaches that address the needs of the users. And then testing those designs, evaluating whether your design works for the users that you're trying to design it for. Uh, there are also, I should say, some related terms, or buzzwords, concepts, methods that you may have heard in the context of human-centered design. One of them is usability or usability testing, ergonomics, universal design, participatory design, user experience. 
Um, and these all fit into the kind of user-centered design paradigm. Uh, another way to understand what HCD is, is to uh, think about what it is not. Um, HCD is not a process where you design by your intuition of what you think people want. It's not a way of designing what you yourself would want. Um, it's not necessarily designing what's the most profitable solution. Um, and it's not necessarily designing the easiest solution, although a good human-centered design process can, uh, can lead you to, uh, can indeed follow your intuitions, or rather can confirm your intuitions. Um, or it can also lead to profit, potentially. Um, here's one representation of the human-centered design process. Uh, it follows a set of steps um, from initial analysis or user research through iterative approaches, designing and evaluating your designs, and then implementing something for your users. Uh, you can see it's not necessarily a straight ahead process. The arrows go backwards and forwards, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, but there is an overall trajectory to it, and you can think of it kind of conveniently in the HCD as standing for hear, create, and deliver as three general phases of the process. In the hear phase, um, this is when you're doing research with your users. You, you're trying to understand your audience. Uh, who, who are the people that you're designing for? What is the purpose? Uh, what do they want or need? And what's the context in which they'll be using something or, or in which their needs will need to be met? Uh, one way that you can elicit information from your users is by interviewing them um, or using focus groups. And this is a great way to understand what people explicitly want or need, what they struggle with. Uh, to get information like this from a broader set of users, you can also use surveys. Um, and surveys can elicit information about what people do, do, what their activities are, or what they like, what they dislike, what they want. And you can also uh, elicit in the user research phase um, directly uh, by observing users um, and studying their activities. In the create phase, uh, you begin uh, to experiment with potential ways of, of addressing the needs of the users that you discovered in the user research phase. This is supposed to be an exploratory design phase, a creative process. So instead of jumping straight to a tried and true solution, what worked for you last time, um, or the easiest solution, the, the goal is to try to think about what solutions might actually meet the user's needs best. So often in an HCD design process, you start, up with, you start off with, with brainstorms, with sketches, notes, and prototypes. Prototypes are simple or semi-functional versions of the design that are easy to make, easy to change, um, and they're lightweight enough, and you haven't invested enough in them uh, that you would feel uncomfortable dumping them if they don't seem to work out. This lets you try a lot of different approaches easily and quickly without getting stuck, stuck on one approach to real. Uh, prototypes are also great tools for communicating your design to other people, whether they're your users or other designers that you want to bounce your ideas off of. They help you explain your designs and communicate your goals, um, and people can actually interact with and use your prototypes. And so these, these, these interim designs, these iterations, can help you with the third phase, um, which is testing. And finally, as you, as you iterate through a series of prototypes, you begin to narrow down the design possibilities. Um, and uh, potentially, you begin to come up with a better idea of what your final solution might be for the design. And at that phase, you start to um, actually build a more functional version of the design. The third phase, and remember that since it's an iterative process, you're actually kind of going back and forth between this design phase and, and testing phase. Um, we're calling deliver. And this is where you're actually testing the prototypes that you've created or the designs that you've created with users. Um, and at this phase, you should be prepared to ask people what they think, to listen, to observe, um, and then to revise what you've made based on uh, what you're seeing. Uh, as with your initial user research, there are different ways to test your designs. Um, you can actually uh, observe people and, and quantify what they're doing. Um, fortunately, in our movement, this doesn't usually require putting electrodes on people's heads. Uh, you can also do user tests, um, which is a kind of a formal way of bringing people into kind of a controlled space and asking them to do stuff with your design, um, and then taking notes, tracking how long it takes them to do stuff, whether they're successful. Um, sometimes you'll give them a script. 
And another way, and these are just a few of the different methods for testing a design, another way is to actually just release the design in the wild and, and allow people to just use it um, for the tasks they want to use it for in their normal setting. Uh, and this is particularly useful for actually getting a sense of whether people like it, whether they will adopt it, um, whether it actually does what it's supposed to do in, uh, in the context in which it's supposed to perform. So uh, just to reiterate this diagram, and this is the first of several of these kind of workflow diagrams you'll see. Um, the idea behind a human-centered design process is that you're trying to build something that solves a problem for people, um, or that makes someone's life better, or improves their ability to do the things that they want to do. And so the key thing about a human-centered design process, again, you start with the user needs and you maintain a focus on what users want and need throughout the entire process. Um, and this turns out to be a very effective process within our movement um, and, and actually a very, and can be used for a diverse uh, array of uh, different problem spaces and um, different kinds of tasks. So uh, Jesse is going to talk about a couple examples of human-centered design in our movement. Cool. Well, like Jonathan said, one of the reasons this is um, so relevant for our movement is um, that our community, us in here, are like the broader community community, it's our biggest asset. We are not just a website or product, we're really a group of people behind it. So a lot of the stuff around human-centered design, you might have been listening and think, this is, yeah, this is of course what we should do, like we're about people for people. And um, and that's why we wanted to present it as a, as a concept and also um, share some examples of how it's being used in creative ways that others uh, others are not using it. There's also times where we haven't used it where we should. Um, there's examples of, of uh, different tools or features, for example, that might be developed and in, in put into um, Wikipedia for ed that are supposed to be to help editors, but the editors who are the humans behind it don't actually want them. So those are that's an example of when it isn't used when it could be. Um, some examples of, of how it's being used now, at least internally at the Wikimedia Foundation, is with a lot of the mobile work. So some questions that are out there is, how do we humanize our Wikipedia articles? How do we show that the, the articles themselves are created and maintained by people often, and in box, of course, sometimes? Um, and, and, that's, and that idea of, of humanizing the articles um, is affecting a lot of the different Wikipedia mobile editing projects that are going on now. And if you're interested in the design process behind that, check out our blog about that. Um, it also has gone a lot into the Wikipedia Zero work. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Wikipedia Zero is, is about how to get access to our free knowledge sources um, globally. So when we think about the problem of, you know, okay, we know that a lot of we aren't reaching a lot of people in the world. What do those What do those people want? Well, how do they access information now? And what should and, or could we um, develop to meet that need? That's really the way we started the approach to Wikipedia Zero Work, and um, that was a project that I was involved in a lot in the start. So we were going out in the field often and, and talking to people. How do you get information? What do you use? And if you can't, it was mobile devices. Okay, like what's your big barrier for accessing information on your mobile devices? And you know, we found out a lot of interesting things, which is how we came up with the Wikipedia Zero Work. And this human-centered design concept is also something we um, we see a lot from the broader community. I work on the, the grant-making team within the Wikimedia Foundation, and what we've seen, a lot of our best grants that we get are ones that, knowingly or not, are using this type of process. They're ones that are really engaged with their community on um, the various components of the scale that, that Jonathan walked through. Uh, and I want to give just a few examples to you now. Um, so for example, in the here phase, we fund projects that are all about hearing what's going on in the field. One that's going on right now is um, women in Wikipedia. So we, we don't know a lot about why women want or do edit Wikipedia or why they don't edit Wikipedia. We just know that there is this gap, is the gender gap as we called it, uh, within Wikipedia. So we're actually funding, uh, giving a grant um, to just hear what women are saying and build that side of the chain. There's also things on other components of the chain that have already started with the here. One example is um, with the Wikimedia Netherlands, which is doing a, 
um, they've already done some hearing of what their community wants and is interested in. And right now, they're iterating on a bunch of different types of projects to really improve two content areas within Wikipedia. And what they found out in, uh, were of interest for their community was uh, nature in, in World War II, I think. <laughs> so they're trying tons of different things to see what is engaging people in these topics. How can, um, they're trying experiments with edit-a-thons and outreach events, online and offline, engaging different partners and experts in those areas, et cetera. And they're seeing what is really gonna work. And that's what they're working on right now. Um, and then on the deliver side, one example uh, is the, the Wikipedia library. And they, again, had gone through maybe not processed in this way, but had gone through these phases of listening to editors and hearing what is it that a really active editor needs to make a high quality article. Okay, they heard that you know access to sources to improve articles was actually a big barrier for those editors. And they iterated on a few different ideas for how to address that. And now we've, they found that creating an online library of free resources, the Wikipedia library, as it's called in the English Wikipedia, seems to work really well, and they're really digging their heels in to develop, to develop that project. So we're excited about the way that this is being used, not just in the foundation, but also um, within the broader community and, uh, and across the different points of the chain. So Yana is going to walk us through one example, one really creative way that it has been used uh, within our legal team, which isn't usually a team that you would think of as as using this type of human-centered design process. And um, she's going to share something about that. trademark policy, which is a good example of how to apply um, an open and collaborative process like this to something like a legal document, which is usually developed by lawyers in strict confidentiality and not in open collaborative uh, ways. So uh, the motivation behind changing our trademark policy was to um, try to make our trademark uses more open, um, easier to, um, to reach um, uh, um, for community members and to be more consistent with the sort of decentralized nature of the community. And um, essentially to be able to make it easier for community members to use the trademarks in the projects and to promote the projects. Um, and then we also had to sort of balance it with the trademark protection because um, the trademarks are really necessary to be able to prevent things like phishing sites, uh, people click advertising sites, um, things of that nature. And in order to be able to do that, we need to maintain legal protection, which um, essentially uh, disappears if we don't strictly control trademarks under the trademark law. So that's sort of the legal uh, requirements that are imposed on us. Um, and we're, that's the sort of things we have to keep in mind when doing this process. Um, so we applied a particular type of human-centered design process to um, developing the policy, which is called design thinking. And it's a process developed at uh, Stanford Design School and then uh, worked on by IDEO to make it more applicable to industry. And it's essentially, it's, it's similar to other types of human-centered design uh, processes. Um, and it involves, involves five steps, which is to uh, um, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and then test. So in terms of empathizing, we started off by doing a community consultation to really try to talk to the, the people who would be using the trademark policy and figure out what are their pain points. Um, so we started a, oh wow, you really can't see it. it this, is, this is just a screenshot of, uh, of the consultation, uh, or a, a tiny fraction of it, really. Um, so we started off the consultation, outlined the sort of the background issues that I just discussed a little bit, and um, and started off with a few questions that that we pointed out were just conversation starters, and and then the discussion started, and we had all kinds of topics come up that were far beyond the uh, the, dis the questions that we raised, um, which was great because it pointed out to us what sort of issues people were having, um, but of course online uh, conversation is really not the type of 
place where you can empathize with the users. So one thing we did was to reach out to people in person and try to talk to people at uh, last year's Wikimania to just get, get a sense of like what are the sort of things that people would like to be able to work smoother. Um, lots of people followed up after Wikimania in emails as well to kind of just like list out the different community uses that, that were important. Um, and then another thing we did was to observe people trying to use the trademark policy in process. So we have a, we used to have a um, application process whereby people would send us requests so we could sort of observe how people were treat, how people were trying to work with the trademark policy. Um, and things we saw um, just by responding to requests was that um, folks were really, really confused about what are the sort of things that we don't actually need a trademark permission for, uh, that, that the trademark policy actually allows in the first place, or things that are fair use um, that people repeatedly kept asking us about. What are the sort of things we want to be able to flag up front um, to make it easier for, for uh, users? Um, and then I spend lots of time reading old uh, on wiki discussions about various controversies and just mailing lists of open source communities that had uh, similar controversies to what we've had, but um, we may not have had yet, but what our trademark policy really should be able to anticipate. Um, and, um, and that sort of informed the process. So once we had all of that data, we could sit down and try to define the problem. And I put together a super long list of various issues that we wanted to be able to resolve, but I think that they can boil, uh, be boiled down to two main issues. One is to make uh, uses uh, easy for community members, um, and the other is to try to make the policy as user-friendly as possible, because even if the policy itself makes uh, users user-friendly, people just don't know because it's, it's difficult to interact with legal documents. So um, once we had that, we started uh, the uh, brainstorming process, which we did by um, doing lots of research, both into how various open source and collaborative communities have resolved the issue, and, and also just legal research to try to find methods that haven't been used in the past. Um, one thing that we identified was the collective membership mark that um, doesn't require a trademark license at all, which seemed to be a good solution to the problems we're having. Um, and the other thing we did was to do uh, legal design sessions at Stanford Design School. So here we are working with our policy, and we invited uh, people, um, people, mostly uh, law students, design students, and CS folks to try to think about how we can make the policy more intuitive. Um, and, um, and from there, we went to creating prototypes. Um, and I think we had lots of different prototypes throughout the process, but uh, the main prototype that we presented for community discussion can be divided into three different layers of abstraction, so to say. Uh, the first one is substance, what did we do substantively, um, and then the language and the design. So substantively, we wanted to be able to make community uses of the marks as easy as possible. And um, of course, we, could, we did present um, a long um, legal document that explained how we did that, but uh, that's not the best way of sort of presenting a prototype for discussion. So the other thing we did was to create the charts that just compared substantively the old policy versus the new policy to outline what, what those um, easy uses were in the new policy. And so the green uses represent the things that you could now do without the trademark license. The yellow uses are the sort of things that previously required a trademark license and mostly didn't anymore. Um, in, in the instances that they did, we we uh, streamlined the process to make it faster through a wiki license that would be available on wiki or a streamlined trademark application process that uh, where you use a special form. Um, and then the red uses are the things that previously were not allowed um, under the old policy. And then uh, we also worked with the language of the policy. So um, you'll remember that in um, defining the problem, we figured out that um, lots of uh, the problems depended not so much on the substance of the policy, but on the fact that people just, just didn't know what was in the policy. So we tried to make the language as easy as possible. Um, and so we wrote the, the policy using short sentences, simple words, uh, simple sentence structure. Um, and then we would run it through readability indices um, until we got lower scores. Um, that didn't necessarily tell us that the policy would be easier to understand, but at least we had that as sort of a a starting point and then community members could tell us that certain aspects were not easy to understand and we could still revise the language um, and then you know working uh, 
at getting humans in the loop. Um, and then uh, finally, we worked with the design. So Heather design or uh, um, created a um, a wiki version of the design that we worked out in the uh, Stanford Design uh, School workshops, um, which essentially used the traffic light colors to uh, easily tell people when uses were allowed without a, tra a trademark license when the trademark license was necessary and what kind of license you required, and then the few uses that uh, weren't allowed. I'm realizing now that this is kind of small for you, so you may not be able to, to see it on the slide, but this, the slides are hopefully going up on comments afterwards. Um, and then um, another thing we did was to develop icons to make it easy to navigate the policy. So here are a few of the icons that we uh, developed in the session. So these were all sort of prototypes that we then presented uh, for community review. Um, and so finally, we had the testing phase. So in the testing phase, we presented all of these prototypes for, for a two-month community consultation and worked on that um, and sort of re reiterated um, the policy. And we had 130 edits to the policy, both to, to the design and the language of the policy um, to make it even more user-friendly, even more permissible, even more liberal, mostly very liberal, uh, which is good, good news. Um, and then, um, and then we had a few iterations after the policy was adopted by the board. So even though technically the text of the policy could not be changed, the design could still be tweaked. So, so even after the policy was adopted, we had people uh, tell us that, hey, as I'm using this, I'm, I'm sort of not seeing the icons you have on this side, and we could sort of eliminate them or move them uh, to, to the other side. And we also had a frequently asked questions uh, portion of the policy that could be adopted, and so um, it you know it contained um, 85 questions, and we could continue expanding on that um, when we got questions. Um, so, what were the outcomes of the policy? It's kind of hard to say because we've had um, six months to see people use this document in practice. But I think what we've seen so far is just far less confusion. Uh, people are know when they can use the policy without asking for permission. There's lots of um, various printouts and and, and um, uh, posters and things like that that I'm seeing here at Wikimania that are permitted under the policy. No one asked us about it. Great, people are getting it. Um, so <laughs> um, and then uh, so we're, we're, we're it's just I think so far uh, we're seeing lots of good stuff. Um, and then the next step is that we're setting up a human-centered design resources page on Meta that you can have a look at and try to incorporate in projects if that's something you're interested in and, and then continue sharing because I think we're uh, sharing as we're um, learning from this process and that's all good stuff. So I'm gonna stop there. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we're going into the next session. No, okay, no time for questions, but we'll be around and you can talk to us. Both the resources page and the slides will be linked from our submission page on just going to go through the attributions. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, citation, and then you can see the source from which it, which it comes, okay? And it's not that Wikipedians made this up, okay, point two. Point one, you have to have a citation when you have a fact. Point two, uh, this actually has a precedent. It goes back hundreds of years. It's a tradition of academic publishing. When you make an assertion, it's, it's good to have a citation for whatever your source is for having that assertion, okay? And then point three, there's, there's people like me. Uh, I, I want to be a content contributor to Wikipedia. So it's helpful to me if there's good citation structure on Wikipedia. It's, it's helpful to any content creator, any content contributor to Wikipedia if they know how to make a citation. So just for some background, some problems that people might have, just the beginning, going to Wikipedia and making a citation. It's not trivial. Some people stumble even at that point. Uh, supposing you're a content creator and you want to know if the, uh, your citations are being used or where on Wikipedia they're being used, it's difficult to, to find that out. So uh, on, the, on the panel here today, there's different people going to talk about different aspects of citations. We don't have much time, perhaps three minutes per person, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to go to the next. Um, who, who would like to volunteer to be first? Maybe. Uh, uh, okay, uh, this is Max Klein. He's uh, a wiki data person, so the idea is perhaps someday uh, citations can be managed in wiki data. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Max Klein, and um, I'm currently working with um, Wiki Project Open Access, uh, but uh, mostly today I want to talk to you about um, wiki data and, okay. Um, so, uh, Wikidata can change everything um, on, on how we handle citations because um, if there are some, basically some core cool language independent general principles that I want to discuss. So, um, the motivation that I really have with, with Wikidata is this question that I want to be able to ask on a Wikipedia page, which is, what sources do I have to believe in order to believe this Wikipedia page? So, it's like maybe I don't trust specific journals and then I could just like discount those and then I would know like, yeah, so I, I basically can understand what things are resting on um, in that way. Um, so, um, I want to talk to you about how that works. So, I'm, I'm going to, oops, okay. I, this is um, the Wiki, Wikidata page for Earth. Uh, why isn't it? If it, I want to, um, I'm really into I, um, teletext. I don't know if you're into that as well. And teletext art, okay. And this thing is happening. Okay. So I'll go out. This is a Linux machine. Okay. Um, so anyway, basically, I want to go to the wiki page for Earth, and if I try to look at the Wikipedia page for Earth. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try and move my window over. Okay, so if you look at the Wikipedia page for Earth, that has the semantic pro wiki, sorry, Wikidata page. Um, it has a start date. The Earth has a start date. <laughs> um, uh, okay, and. Oh, I think I know what happened. Okay. Anyway, so that has a start date and then it has a reference, and um, that's as important as other people are going to uh, use it. And then the reference basically links to um, a, a, a specific uh, journal article, and that journal article is a wiki, Wikidata item. Um, and okay, and then that Wikidata, that journal is, has a semantic property that says like it's part of a journal. And so then we have all those sort of uh, citation, um, citations sort of semantically stacked. And that what's really clever about that is right now the way that ref citations work is they're just stored in wiki text, but now we can start relying on the wiki data data. And so then we can also run queries like um, this Wikipedia page relies on all these journals, and maybe these journals are funded by specific you know specific items. So we can do kind of clever semantic lookups in that way. So I think the semantic data that we can put, we can start linking in wiki data can um, basically simplify, well, it seems complicated, but I think ultimately it will simplify um, the way that citations work, because also if you have multiple citations, like if you're doing it in Zotero, you just cite something once and you'd only have one entry, uh, same thing can happen in Wikidata. So I think I'm coming close to my three minutes. This is David Quinka. he's an expert on Wikisource. 
Well, actually, I'm just a contributor in Wicked Source. <laughs> but yeah, I've been many years in um, contributing to Wicked Source. Uh, Wicked Source is a Wikimedia project. As Wikipedia, as Wikidata, it started to, um, yeah, to collect uh, all the sources that are used in uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, don't look at the screen. Sorry, I'm looking forward to using it, right? Yeah, maybe not. It's okay, fine. So um, instead of a presentation, um, we'll do a do it yourself presentation. So I invite you to go to the Tyrannosaurus Rex page in Wikipedia. So I'll give you time so that you can go there. <laughs> And yeah, if you go, if you scroll right to the bottom of the page in Wikipedia, in the English Wikipedia, you will see that there is a link to Wikisource. And um, yeah, that's, an, that's a scientific article from 1905. Um, and it has very nice illustrations. So that means that uh, even uh, uh, all scientific publications can be reused. And uh, they contain uh, valuable information that can be later incorporated into the article. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, what we are trying to do is to automate this linking. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is writing an article about a dinosaur or whatever, mm -hmm. then you can uh, see if we have some available sources and then incorporate that uh, content into Wikipedia. So at the moment, that's all manual. Mm -hmm. But um, as you can see, it has some potential for, uh, for uh, including more knowledge and also for incorporating other sources because, uh, well, nowadays with the open access movement, um, there are also more available information that can be incorporated into Wikisource and then from there just into Wikipedia, uh, through Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's, I'm going to close here. If you have later any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We are saving time for questions. This is Megan Watcha. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's correct. And I think, uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, I'm just going to stay here for uh, ease of transport. Um, if for some reason you can't hear me for a moment, just raise your hand and I will speak up. Um, so my name is Megan Watcha, and I am the Performing Arts Librarian at Barnard College, uh, which is, uh, for anyone that's not familiar with it, it's a very small undergraduate institution that operates under the larger umbrella of Columbia University in the city of New York. Um, I'm here as a researcher, but also as an educator, one that onboards uh, new editors, and to share my librarian love of citations with all of you. Um, as a librarian, my job um, is really not only to make sure that my community has access to information, but that they have the tools they need to use that information effectively and responsibly. Um, and whether I'm working with a dancer, a dramaturg, or a uh, student that wants to be a Wikipedian, um, citations are really central to this, both in terms of thinking about how information comes to them and about what happens to that information when they put it back out into the world. Flip. Okay. So when we talk about citations, we most often talk about um, how they're used to support and to validate a claim by referring back to other authors and studies. And this is a very real function, a very important function. But I'd like to take it a step further and really think about the author not as a unitary authoritative voice, but as part of a dialogic process. And in, the, in this context, citation is about documenting communication and conversation. Um, this is in no way a new idea. Um, if I can back up maybe 300 years, um, it's very much rooted in the origins of citation practices. Um, scholars actually once exchanged ideas through written letters, but with the proliferation of information afforded by the, um, the printing press, publishers and professional societies needed a codified, structured way of referring to each other's works. Um, and also saying, hey, I said this first. Okay. Um, so now, at this particular moment, we are experiencing a similar proliferation of information brought on by the internet age. Um, and so we can and are revisiting how we cite. Um, organizations have developed unique IDs to, um, to distinguish between authors that might share a common name. So how do I know this Mark Newton from that Mark Newton? Um, Professional societies, such as the Modern Language Association, have recognized that information comes to us from all sorts of sources, not just books and articles, um, and have developed ways to cite that information. In 2012, they developed a method for citing a tweet. 
With the momentum of the open access movement behind them, there are initiatives um, such as the one led by my fellow panelists uh, with signaling open access um, to develop ways of communicating when a citation links to content, content that can be um, freely read and reused um, rather than locked behind a paywall. And I would really love to see professional societies pick this up as well. Um, so what if, for instance, the Modern Language Association developed a way to cite a preprint um, rather than the publisher's PDF, which many of us do not have access to. Um, in my own work, which is very much um, pedagogical um, from the position of an editor and a reader, um, I look to citations as a site to identify and as a means to subvert structures of power. Um, we talk about the gender gap um, you know, that between 84 and 91% of Wikipedians identify as male, meaning women and women's um, perspectives are vastly underrepresented. So I work with women and other underrepresented groups to write new articles, um, add to existing ones, pulling on citation for works that represent or are written by members of their community. So what is it to bring a feminist perspective into an existing article? I also examine how the slow adoption of open access in the um, humanities really restricts um, what content can be made available on Wikipedia. So for instance, in my primary area of specialty, which is dance, um, notable individuals, choreographic works, and really entire genres um, are absent from Wikipedia because the group that studies them is so new, so small, and so um, protective of their content. Um, so much so uh, that they didn't develop the defining feature of any discipline, the multi-volume encyclopedia, until 1998. So what few articles are out there on a topic aren't available to cite because they are locked behind paywalls. So my hope is that um, today, by having a conversation um, and revisiting citation practices on Wikipedia, we can not only change how we collect the sum of all knowledge, but also perhaps have an impact upon how that knowledge is initially created. So, hi, I'm Adam Becker. Uh, I'm a researcher in the labs division of the Public Library of Science, PLOS. We're an open access nonprofit scientific publisher. We, we publish, among other journals, PLOS One, the largest scientific journal in the world. And we also publish PLOS Computational Biology, which we already saw today with the uh, flu trans paper. Uh, so, after hearing my uh, other three fellow panelists speak and other talks earlier today, uh, I, I feel uh, refreshed that I don't have to convince people in this room that citations are important and worthwhile. I think <laughs> we're already all on board with that. Um, instead, what I want to convince you of is that citations can be much more than what they already are. Uh, right now, there are binary connections between two entities. You know, I, I cite something, I put, you know, some sort of identifier of some kind, be it a chunk of text with bibliographic information or DOI or something at the end of a Wikipedia article or a scientific paper. And so that's a connection between the two of them. Uh, it's not machine readable, and it just says that there's a connection between them. There's, there's not more there. And if I try to make it machine readable, all I get is that binary piece of information that the two are connected. So what if they carry more information? We already heard about having them carry license information. That's very important. Uh, what about other information, like the location of the citation or citations from the uh, within the citing article? Uh, you know, whether it shows up in the introduction, the conclusion, or both. Uh, what about the immediate context? Uh, you know, what what if uh, what if someone's citing something for a contrary view? What if someone's citing something? Uh, to support it along, uh, to support a statement that they're making along with, you know, five other things, or what if they're just citing this one thing over and over and over again throughout their paper, or throughout the article, or throughout whatever. You know, this, this is uh, not merely a binary connection between two things. There's so much more information there that we need to be able to access. What about annotations to the thing that's being cited? What about updates? What if it's been retracted or discredited in some way? What if we had all of this information? What if it was machine readable and associated with the citations on every single thing on Wikipedia, 
on every single open access scientific paper on every single scientific paper because they all should be open access. Uh, and, and while we're at it, why don't we throw in something really radical like having, uh, I don't know, all of the bibliographic information about the cited thing, you know, maybe the full author list, just to get really wild. Uh, <laughs> maybe the full journal title. <laughs> Uh, so imagine that everyone cited everything like this. Imagine that Wikipedia cited everything like this. Imagine that every open access publisher cited everything like this. And then imagine that everybody else came along with us. Well, then what could we do with that? We could use these richer citations to build an open citation database that would let us, it would be an enormously, an enormously powerful tool that would let us build out essentially a dependency tree, not just for all the world's scientific research, but for all the information in the world. If I wanna know why we know something, I wanna know what it depends on, I could go in there and just trace it all the way back to every single fact that that other fact depends on. And I could grab all of the data because the data should be open too. And I would know whether or not the citation was to data or to code or to a paper or to an article or to whatever. And I would know when and where that citation was made. So this is something that we're working on in PLOS Labs. Uh, and we're really excited to be working with Wikipedia about this and to be telling all of you about what we're, uh, what we're doing and, and hopefully uh, working together. And uh, I, I can tell you more about what we're doing now and I'm also giving a talk at 2.30 on Sunday in the Fountain Room, apparently, as I found out earlier today. Um, <laughs> so that's going to be interesting. Um, but uh, citations are important. We need to make them richer. So let's do that. So we're at, we're at a Wikipedia conference. The audience is required to ask questions. We have uh, ten, 10 minutes for questions. This is Max with Wikidata. Uh, David, he's doing Wikisource archiving. Uh, Megan, she's an information scientist like Marion and Adam, uh, astrophysicist and uh, with an academic publishing magazine. Does somebody have a question for any of these? You, you start in the front. Uh, okay, so uh, there in 2011, so my name is Mika, no, earlier. <laughs> uh, in 2011, I helped write a proposal for a new Wikimedia project called Wikisite. It was, by my count, at that point, the fifth attempt to create a uh, Wikimedia project for collecting information about, uh, I list all the others, I'm uh, And then someone edited it in 2012 to say, this project is waiting for Wiki Wikidata. I don't know what that means, but we were waiting for it. Uh, in any case, the question, the, the goal there was basically something that touches on something that a lot of you suggested, which is we should have a page, it, there should be a page that we can link to from every article. So one concern that I have is that if someone cites uh, uh, like a, cites a, something in one article, and then there's a long conversation about it in the talk page that says, this is totally not, this is a debunked study. You have the same, the next time that's cited on a different article, you have the same conversation. It would be nice to have one place. Um, there are also existing projects like uh, ACAWiki, which is a wiki for summaries of academic articles and metadata associated with it, which uh, <coughs> like exists and people contribute to, but uh, would really love to be integrated, more integrated to work in the, I speak as a contributor to that site would love to be integrated into this. So the question is, how have things changed? And if it's, uh, and like, uh, and what should we do if we want to push this forward? And and uh, I don't know, do you guys all want to help build this proposal? Like all, all of us? Uh, like turn like like turn this into a concrete thing that we can move forward to turn into a new project or maybe a new facet on top of Wikidata? I don't know. Um, and maybe a good place to have that conversation would be the Wikisite page in Meta, even if it ends up not being a separate project, but I'd love to hear what, what we should do. Okay, yeah, well, my response about that would be that, uh, yeah, I, I don't, this, the message is definitely not like, this is something new, and of course there's a long history, and this is like the sixth or whatever attempt to do that, and, and that's definitely, I, I know that, and I think that what's changed is just that technology is almost there to do it, and you know, French, actually the French uh, have a citation namespace, or like a reference namespace, so like, there's definitely a precedent for it, and I think that um, now it's going to be different, or possibly, you know, because of the, um, because of Wikidata and the ability to, and, and the, the, the steam that's already behind that. Um, so I would talk about it more on help colon sources on Wikidata. Help colon sources on yeah. Wikidata. Yeah, okay. that's what I like to do. Yeah. You start in the back. 
Yes, yes. Hi, I'm Andy Mallet. I'm the Wikipedia ninja editor with Orchid. Here's a commercial break. Orchid is a system for providing identifiers for contributors to academic papers and other works. Uh, you should all sign up for one of your contributors and work us through the community. Uh, question for the panel is how can Orchid be included in the sorts of things you're talking about? Megan, as a librarian, can you say something? Sort of. Yeah, well, uh, the idea is that uh, each source will have um, a page in Wikidata, and uh, that source will be connected to the author, and the author is the place to be connected to Orsid. Um, I mean, it's going to be a challenge to import all the sources into Wikidata and later to find out the correspondence with Orsid, but um, that will be an ongoing process. I mean, it cannot be done in, uh, in a few days. It's going to be a matter of a long, long process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the problem at the moment, at the moment is uh, to import the sources that are used in uh, in Wikipedia, and uh, later on to to uh, find the the real author. Because if we have the text, uh, we are not sure of the identity of, of the author. So we need to uh, cross match these registers. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd also say, I mean, so I serve on the advisory committee to the Institutional Repository for Columbia University, which I think is very much tied to this in terms of making, you know, resources openly available. Um, and we work with our community to adopt, um, you know, unique identifiers such as ORCID IDs. Many of us, you know, include them on our resumes, et cetera. Um, so I see this as a twofold issue of both outreach and then adoption within, you know, how it can be easily input into citation information. Um, but I think that that process is going to take perhaps a great deal of time because that, you know, these sorts of identifiers really need to establish themselves. We have about four minutes left for questions, you ma'am. So non-text based. Can you repeat the question? Also? Yeah. So, so my understanding of the question, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is um, is how could we possibly bring um, bring in an opportunity to cite um, materials that aren't text based in Wikipedia? So that can be sound, it can be images, um, you know, moving and otherwise, right? Um, this is something that I work a lot with. Um, I work with folks in um, dance, theater, film, and music. Um, and we talk a lot about this in terms of their research. They, um, the citation formats are certainly there. Um, but it's a matter of educating the researchers. So I can, you know, in terms of how you can cite a moving image um, as, <clears throat> you know, as fact-based. It, it certainly does bring up neutral point of view issues. Um, I'm not being particularly articulate. Let me give an example. If you're writing an article, um, a Wikipedia article, about um, a work of fiction, right, there is a very clear way of, um, of kind of going through and establishing like the plot line, et cetera, right? And you can cite back to the original object. If I want to cite a dance, I might have a document of that dance in a video format. Um, but, and conceivably, I should be able to translate that into citations. Um, you know, here she raises her legs, here this, you know, particular um, character enters and Orpheus rises her up, whatever. Um, and that precedent hasn't been set that I'm aware of, um, but it's certainly something, there's talk right now in the somewhat very silent um, Wiki Project dance of establishing um, uh, you know, a style guide, and I think that that would be something that would be really helpful to address. I think we have time for one more question. Does, we've got a publisher here. Does someone have a question for Adam from Plus, Plus Publisher? Question for Adam. Uh, yes, you, you ma'am. Thank you. 
data or embed it in a slightly different way than their head wraps around it. They really resist that idea. So how do you create a database and a way of having all this rich metadata that is going to be equally useful to different people? So if we, uh, th this is an excellent question. To, uh, th just to repeat it, um, uh, my understanding of the question was, uh, since different people use citations in different ways, especially in the humanities, how are we going to basically curate this rich information about citations in a way that's useful for everyone? Um, so the, the, the first order approximation of the answer to that uh, is uh, if we do it in a way that's machine readable, then we can output the information in a way that's human readable along many different you know, formats. Uh, so, you know, pick a format and we can output the information. Um, going a little bit deeper, uh, there's this... So people use reference managers when they, when they write academic papers. Um, maybe they even use them when they write uh, Wikipedia articles, though, though I don't really think so. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there's there's all of this extra information about the references that shows up in the reference manager that then gets lost when it's sent off to the publisher. Um, and we're trying to sort of get that information back. Uh, ideally, uh, we, we wouldn't like to go through this process. We'd like to just grab the information from the author's reference manager. Um, you know, as it is, we're, we're essentially trying to make a cow from a hamburger. Uh, and uh, um, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Uh, it's a little messy, uh, and it's not going to be to everyone's taste. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, but as long as the information is structured in some way, we should be able to handle it. Yes, this is true. That's true. <laughs> it's not the end of the conversation, but it, it is the end of this presentation. So, uh, Max, David, Megan, Adam, please come to the Uh, so that concludes Social Machines 2. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our, speak thank our speakers, Benjamin McAvill, Tillman Byer, Aaron Shaw, Jesse Wildsneller, Jonathan Morgan, Yana Wellender, Lane Raspberry, and the rest of the panel, and the Bar Centre for hosting us. The next session in this room is Social Machines 3, starting at 2.30.